quite a well-known one from Charles Darwin. Darwin, faced with the complexity of the eye, said, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Well, that famous quotation was always going to be a prime candidate for quote mining, omitting, of course, the words that immediately follow it. Yet reason tells me. <laughs> I think you know it. Um, and you can read it anyway. Using Yahoo's search engine, I have just searched the World Wide Web for I freely confess absurd in the highest degree and obtained 2,890 hits. For comparison, I then searched for if numerous gradations from a perfect and complex I, which is from the following passage, and obtained only 1,550 hits. The former phrase has been quoted nearly twice as often as the latter. Let's call this a mining index of two. It's actually quite a modest mining index. The Cambrian explosion, as you probably know, is an event in the history of life, in the fossil history, in which it appears that about half a billion years ago, a little bit more, most of the great animal phyla rather suddenly appear in the fossil record. Needless to say, creationists love it because it looks to them as though that was, there was nothing before that. These phyla just suddenly sprang into existence. In The Blind Watchmaker, I wrote, I was young and foolish in those days and not aware of the potential for quote mining. I wrote that, that the majority of animal phyla, we find them, quote, already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. I went on to say, needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Well, I was savvy enough, evidently, to realize that creationists would love it, but not, in 1986, savvy enough to know that they would gleefully quote my lines back at me in their own favor, carefully admitting what followed, which was a rather lengthy explanation of the Cambrian explosion and about how, in fact, it must have been preceded by a very long period of evolutionary history. I went on to say, evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record. Well, I uh, did my quote mining index calculation on this as well. Uh, I took the phrase, it is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. I subjected that phrase to Yahoo's search engine and got 1,250 hits. I then looked at the next bit. <laughs> Evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record and got 63 hits. This gives a mining index, 1250 divided by 63 of nearly 20, 19.8. I want now to introduce a special kind of quote mining, which I think you'll recognize uh, when you see it. I call it mining the Eddington concession. Sir Arthur Eddington was a famous British astronomer and, uh, I've, and also a popularizer of science. I've used this quotation often for other purposes. I'm going to read it one more time. Eddington was trying to emphasize the unique, almost, importance of the second law of thermodynamics, and he chose to do it in this way. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it is found to be contradicted by observation, 
Well, these experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can offer you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. <laughs> Notice the rhetorical device that Eddington is using here. Clearly, he wasn't seriously intending to cast doubts on Maxwell's equations, nor on the competence of experimental physicists. Precisely the opposite. Eddington's manifest respect for Maxwell's theorizing and for experimental, experimental physicists was designed to highlight his final extolling of the unbudgeable veracity of the second law of thermodynamics. That rhetorical device is what I am naming the Eddington concession. If a journalist, say, reading the Eddington quotation, announced to the world that Sir Arthur Eddington is skeptical of Maxwell's equations, or Sir Arthur Eddington thinks experimental physicists are all bunglers, that would be mining the Eddington concession. ...into a career as an agriculturalist in the colonial service. He'd always loved wildflowers, knows them all, knows the Latin names, or did. Uh, and my mother, too, had that shared interest with him. So my sister and I certainly were reared by two parents who were interested in natural history, interested in lots of different things, had a sort of um, curiosity about the world. I don't think I could claim to have ever been a child naturalist in the way that I probably should have been. I think my interest in biology came more from sort of bookish concerns. I was interested in things like, where do we come from? What's it all about? Uh, what's it all for? And I think I rather drifted into biology because I thought biology was a good way into answering those deep philosophical questions. I had a very good biology teacher, and I think I probably wouldn't have got into Oxford but for his coaching. And I, I think that I really, really started to flourish in that environment. The Selfish Gene was published in 1976, which was 10 years after my doctorate, approximately. And the reason I began to write a book at all was that the research that I was doing depended on electric apparatus, as much research does, and I couldn't do it. I think it was the time when Heath had the, the um, winter of discontent. So there was power cuts uh, which completely disrupted any attempt to do the research I was doing. So I started to write a book instead, which, which was The Selfish Gene. If you go into the fundamentals of natural selection and ask what actually is it that survives or doesn't survive, it's not the individual, because the individual dies anyway. And you can't say the world becomes full of copies of the individual which are successful, because it's not true. Every individual apart from identical twins, is unique. What the world does become full of is successful genes. So one way to put that is to say individual organisms work for the good of their own reproduction, which is the way Darwin would have put it, or for the good of their own genes, which is a kind of almost equivalent way to put it. What the selfish gene did was to say, right, well, let's, it's really the genes that we need to focus on. It's the genes that are naturally selected. It's the genes that survive or fail to survive as a consequence of their success or failure in building individual bodies. They are self-replicating with great accuracy and they influence their own success in getting themselves replicated. And they influence that success by controlling embryology by, by changing the phenotype, changing the, the shape, the colour, the size of the body in which they sit. And their survival depends on the success of that body in surviving. So the individual body is a machine for the propagation of the genes that ride inside it. In a way, all I was doing was changing the way we look at what was already familiar and focusing on the genes as the actors in the drama.
there was always the risk that some people would misunderstand that to mean that genes were somehow deliberately conscious little gremlins. A few philosophers didn't understand it, but most biologists and most ordinary readers, I think, understood it very well. This is filled with doubt, scepticism, willingness to learn, openness to correction. Faith is exactly the opposite. I'm going to tell two anecdotes to illustrate the difference. Kurt Wise is an American geologist, highly qualified, trained at the University of Chicago and at Harvard in geology and paleontology, under Steve Gould, no less. But he had a fatal weakness. He was infected with deep faith early in his life, and he couldn't shake it off. And as he grew older, after he graduated, he became increasingly uneasy about the mismatch, the incompatibility between his science, his geology, his paleontology, and his scripture. And one evening, he put it to the test with a pair of scissors. He got a Bible, and he went right through the whole Bible with, with a pair of scissors, cutting out, physically cutting out, every verse in the Bible that would have to go if he were to accept the scientific worldview that he'd learned at Chicago and Harvard. I quote, Try as I might, and even with the benefit of intact margins throughout the pages of Scripture, I found it impossible to pick up the Bible without it being rent in two. I had to make a decision between evolution and Scripture. Either the Scripture was true and evolution was wrong, or evolution was true and I must toss out the Bible. It was there that night that I accepted the Word of God and rejected all that would ever counter it, including evolution. With that, in great sorrow, I tossed into the fire all my dreams and hopes in science. I think that's a tragic story. I think that anything, in this case faith, that can do that to a man like Kurt Wise is a force for evil. And if it can do that to a highly educated scientist like Kurt Wise, just think what it can do to the rest of the population. My contrasting story is of a scientist, an elderly scientist who was a senior figure in my department at Oxford when I was an undergraduate. For years, this old man, when I say old, he's probably about the same age I am now, so I have to be careful. He had taught us and he had believed that, uh, that the Golgi apparatus, which is a, a piece of submicroscopic, a piece of microscopic apparatus inside most cells. He believed that the Golgi apparatus was an artifact. He thought it didn't exist. And he had written paper after paper after paper on this. He'd lectured to us undergraduates about this. Uh, and then one day, an American cell biologist came and gave a public lecture in our department in which he demonstrated beyond all possible doubt that the Golgi apparatus was real. Our old man strode to the front of the lecture hall, shook him by the hand, and said, my dear fellow, I wish to thank you. I have been wrong these 15 years. And all of us applauded till our hands were red, and none of us will ever have forgotten that incident. That is science at its best. That's the very opposite of faith. That's knowing when you're wrong and even being pleased to be disproved. That's a bit of an, of an ideal, but uh, that's what he did. What finally baffles me is the way our society, all of our society, has limply bought into the idea that faith should somehow be treated with exaggerated respect. Even secular individuals have come to accept the idea that faith should somehow be immune to criticism, simply because it is faith. Where you would gladly criticize somebody's political views or their artistic taste or their football team or their views on hunting or gun ownership or something like that, when it comes to faith, we are all expected to back off and say, no, no, we can't criticize faith. It isn't done. It's not good manners to criticize faith. Well, I think it's about time we started criticizing faith. The truth is that without this convention of good manners which pervades our society, faith couldn't withstand criticism. 
because it has no resources with which to do the withstanding. How can you defend a position when there are, by definition, no arguments in its favor? So my suggestion is that we should henceforth abandon our social convention of automatic respect for religious faith. Finally, just to make the point that this only a theory, you all have seen that in criticisms of evolution. Evolution is only a theory. It's one of the crosses we have to bear, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> Isn't it ironic that this only a theory actually stems from the non-arrogance of science? Because scientists are careful enough and cautious enough to say that everything they know is only a theory, which is just awaiting disproof. Yet that humility comes back and bites us in the form of the criticism. Evolution is only a theory, which implies that it is in doubt. H.L. Mencken said, we must respect the other fellow's religion, but only in the sense and to the extent that we respect his theory that his wife is beautiful and his children smart. I'm now going to switch gears and look at a couple of criticisms that the hardback God Delusion encountered. Uh, and I've mentioned these in the preface to the paperback, which is now uh, just out. Interestingly, some of the strongest criticisms came from atheists who, although they don't believe themselves, believe in belief, as the philosopher Dan Dennett puts it. I'm an atheist, but I wish to dissociate myself from your shrill, strident, intemperate, intolerant, ranting language. Well, actually, if you look at the language of the God Delusion, it's rather less shrill or intemperate than we regularly, regularly take in our stride when listening to political commentators, for example, theatre critics or book critics or restaurant critics. <laughs> Here are some quotes from restaurant criticisms of London restaurants in the leading papers recently. It is difficult, if not impossible, to imagine anyone conjuring up a restaurant, even in their sleep, where the food in its mediocrity comes so close to inedible. <laughs> All things considered, quite the worst restaurant in London, maybe the world, serves horrendous food grudgingly in a room that is a museum to Italian waiters' taste, Kirko 1976. <laughs> the worst meal I've ever eaten, not by a small margin, I mean the worst, the most unrelievedly awful. What looked like a sea mine in miniature was the most disgusting thing I've put in my mouth since I ate earthworms at school. <laughs> well, insulting a restaurant might seem trivial compared to insulting God, but restaurateurs and chefs really exist, and they have feelings to be hurt. <laughs> Whereas blasphemy, as the witty bumper sticker puts it, is a victimless crime. Another example. In 1915, the British Member of Parliament, Horatio Bottomley, recommended that after the war, if by chance you should discover one day in a restaurant you were being served by a German waiter, you will throw the soup in his foul face. If you find yourself sitting at the side of a German clerk, you will spill the ink pot over his foul head. Now that's strident and intolerant. <laughs> and I should have thought ridiculous and ineffective as rhetoric, even in its own time. The British literary critic Terry Eagleton described the late Kingsley Amis, extremely distinguished novelist, as a racist, anti-Semitic bore, a drink-sodden, self-hating reviler of women, gays, and liberals. Well, I think that compares fairly well with my own beginning of chapter two of The God Delusion, which is the passage most often quoted as strident or shrill. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> now, that's the passage most often quoted as strident or shrill. It's not for me to say whether I succeeded, but my intention was closer to robust humour 
a humorous broadside rather than shrill polemic. I don't think words like misogynistic, infanticidal, genocidal, megalomaniacal, that doesn't sound shrill to me. Something about those long words suggests that... <laughs> My wife, Lala, and I do a, a sort of double act reading from my books when they're published. And one of the things you have to do in order to warm an audience up is to get them laughing early. And so with each book, we try to pick a humorous passage near the beginning, and we always pick that passage for the God delusion. It, it, it sort of gets a laugh. As, as, as this, this one is another one, um, which at least it was my intention to be humorous, um, about Our Lady of Fatima. Um, and there you see some typical examples of Catholic kitsch. <laughs> <laughs> this is a quote from The God Delusion now. Pope John Paul II created more saints than all his predecessors of the past several centuries put together, and he had a special affinity with the Virgin Mary. His polytheistic hankerings were dramatically demonstrated in 1981 when he suffered an assassination attempt in Rome and attributed his survival to intervention by Our Lady of Fatima. A maternal hand guided the bullet. One cannot help wondering why she didn't guide it to miss him altogether. <laughs> Others might think the team of surgeons who operated on him for six hours deserved at least a share of the credit but perhaps their hands, too, were maternally guided. The relevant point is that it wasn't just Our Lady who, in the Pope's opinion, guided the bullet, but specifically Our Lady of Fatima. Presumably Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Guadeloupe, Our Lady of Medjugorje, Our Lady of Akita, Our Lady of Zaitun, Our Lady of Garabandal, and Our Lady of Nock were busy on other errands at the time. <laughs> I think that's quite funny, too. Uh, pure Monty Python. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's quite true that many people do feel very strongly about their faith and very offended if you insult it. Uh, we've come to expect never to be offended. What you say is offensive to me. Let's raise our consciousness. What's so special about religious arguments that they should be immune to exactly the same kind of rational discussion as political or any other kind of arguments? Opposition to religious education in the sense of education about religion. I think it's important that children should learn about religion. What I am against is the labeling of children with the religion of their parents when the children are too young to know what their own views are. I'm all for children being taught about lots of different religions and then making up their own minds later. What I really object to, and I think it's actually abusive to children, is to take a tiny child and say, you are a Christian child or you are a Muslim child. I've got you here saying that the exclusively religious schools are, quotes, wicked. Well, I think, it's, I think it is wicked if, if children are told you are a member of such and such a faith simply because your parents are. Because after all, every child should be able to work out for themselves that it's an accident of birth that they just happen to be born into, say, a Catholic family or a Muslim family. And for that, fam and for that reason, you oppose faith schools because, in your view, by definition, that's what they're I think, uh, seeking to think, As far achieve. as I can tell, by, by definition, a faith school is propagating one particular faith and it makes the assumption that the children in that school belong to a particular faith which is presumably the faith of their of their parents when you have faith schools it does seem to me talking about a catholic child or or a anglican child uh, you really are making an assumption which is presumptuous and is i think wicked uh, i i I don't think you can get out of it by just saying, oh, it's a, it's a cultural matter. It isn't a cultural matter. You're being taught doctrine. You're being taught doctrine as your doctrine, as opposed to that other child's doctrine in a different, in a different school. That seems to me to be wicked. We have a right to bring up our children in accordance with our beliefs, which have served us over the centuries well. Now, I'll give you the same right to bring up your children in what the way that you want. the rights of the want. children themselves? Well, the rights of the children come when, uh, when they are uh, as is, uh, they're old enough to understand the issues. 
until they get to that age. It's the parents' responsibility and, and duty. Do you teach if them you that adults should that, be punished? You may not share that, but that is my religion. That is the way I have been brought up. And I, have, I bring that child into this world. I educate him. I give him everything. It's my right to make sure that I bring him. And I, I take issue with that. You think that it's wicked. Well, that's your point of view. I know that's going to make him a better human being. And what's missing is when you talk about faith, you don't look at what faith teaches. First and foremost, what faith teaches is that, listen, you're a human being, so respect your fellow human beings. And I think that's an important point that you don't want to discuss. What is the penalty for apostasy? And that is the thing apostasy? that you fail to discuss, and that's why you've got those prejudicial views about faith. What respect. is the penalty for apostasy? What do you teach the children will happen to them if they give up the Muslim faith? Well, let's bring the debate back into Britain. What is the and penalty for apostasy? Well, we, use this, we hear the language, tolerate people of other religion. We also hear the word now being bandied about saying, learning to respect people of other religion. This is a red herring. Because in reality, what they mean is this. We are right and they are wrong, but we won't make a fuss about it at the moment. They'll find out soon enough when they die. So this is really a very, at the moment, the, the way the faith schools are kind of run is the way they're, they're presenting faiths themselves are very exclusivist, um, very kind of um, divisive, and I would say s something that should not be funded by with public money. Well, I would be thoroughly in favor of education in the Bible as literature. Uh, you can't understand English literature without, without the Bible. You can't take your allusions. And that's an aspect of what the bishop was saying. He's absolutely right. This is a Christian country. Historically, it's a Christian country. You can't understand English history or English literature without uh, a knowledge of the Bible. Mm. And by the way, I think one should say that, that, that the act of collective worship, I don't approve of it, but nevertheless, the Christian religion, especially I think the Anglican religion, is benign by comparison. If a child at the end of its school career wants to give up religion, the church will quite happily say, OK, go your own way. The penalty for apostasy in the Christian religion is not death. There is no penalty for apostasy at all in the Christian religion. The Christian religion is comparatively benign, and we should respect it as such. Um, Richard Dawkins, does a God-shaped perspective or set of values uh, do any harm to the way in which children should be taught at schools right Thou shalt now. have no other god before me, thou shalt make no graven image, thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy. What on earth's that got to do with anything to do, to do with morals? That's the Ten Commandments, or at least three of them. Uh, it would be deeply depressing if the only way children could get moral values was from religion, either from Scripture, and God knows we don't want them to get it from Scripture, I mean, just look at Scripture, or from... Uh, kind of being afraid of God, being intimidated by, by, by God. Anybody who is good for only those two reasons is not really being good at all. Why not teach children things like the golden rule, do as you would be done by, how would you like it if other children did that to you? So, so why do you do it to them? So, so God is not only irrelevant, God is damaging I didn't this. say God was damaging, but I think it, it's, it's depressing that anybody should suggest that you actually need God in order to... Uh, to be to be moral. I would hope that our morals come from a better source than that and that therefore they are genuinely moral rather than based on outmoded scripture or based on fear. I actually think that um, oftentimes religious principles are actually quite immoral to be quite frank and I think that if you look at examples where um, uh, girls are, t uh, are, are sexualized at a very young age, for example, if you look at Islamic schools where they're forced to avail, where they're taught that they're different from boys, where they're not allowed to listen to music, where they're, not, where they're, where they're completely segregated, and, and many such examples like that. I think, uh, in fact, um, if there is any uh, good morality that comes out of uh, even religious education, it's not because of religion, it's oftentimes despite religion, and it's uh, the result of uh, an enlightenment and a vast social movement uh, for 21st century values that have had an effect on religion as let well. Me, let me bring in, I will come to you in a moment, let me bring in Mohammed Mukadam in response to that, that at Muslim schools the uh, women are put into, girls are put into a position uh, where they are diminished as human beings. Well, it's often uh, the case where people are ignorant of what goes on in faith schools and Muslim schools. The fact is uh, our schools are run along a legal lines. They te uh, treat both sexes equally, provide them with the best opportunities. 
So it's often a case of people who have prejudices and ignorance. Mariam? I mean, I think it's typical of uh, Islamic schools and uh, the political Islamic movement to label any, any criticism a sort of prejudice and thereby racism, thereby trying to uh, make people uh, silence on, silent on criticizing it. I think the issues are very clear. I mean, um, the, the head of the Islamia school, for example, was quoted in an interview saying that uh, there is, you, you're, you're born a Muslim, you're always a Muslim, you can't leave. And that's things that have been told to me untold times for having renounced religion and Islam. Uh, there is threats, there is intimidations. Uh, just yesterday, a 16-year-old girl was killed by her father for refusing to wear the veil. I think Islamic schools very much do suppress did he go and to restrict Islamic school? girls. Uh, of course I did. I lived under the Islamic Sorry, Republic did the person, of Iran. The, the father who killed, did he go to Islamic school? I think Islamic schools, the problem well, with uh, all faith issues. schools, let me be clear that I don't have a problem with all faith schools because I think uh, if Christian Catholic schools are a little more uh, tame, it's because the Enlightenment has tamed them. Uh, I, I agree with Richard Dawkins that children do not have a religion. We have enough examples in the 21st century to know that it has everything to do with religion. And I mean, I think that uh, obviously there are uh, women, and I think with children it's a very different uh, issue. The veil is a form of child abuse, in my opinion. But for adult women, I think they but have a right did, to wear it. Did, she's is, 16. Uh, um, she's, she's an adult, and therefore she, she isn't being abused no, as well, well by well, wearing Well, this the, is the thing. I mean, there might be people who don't. I, I think, socially speaking, the veil is very often uh, uh, imposed on women and I think the problem with um, with the, the thing about education is, is that it has to help children have access to information be able to question and I think the problem with religion is it's actually very restrictive and prescriptive and doesn't allow people to question because these are the rules and you have to adhere by them. I in fact have, have come to this country and chose to put the veil on. I have come to this country without a head, um, a veil on. So, 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 not, so not so very wicked is the view. But what is the penalty for apostasy? What is the penalty for leaving the Muslim faith? Um, to be honest, I cannot back that point up. Dr. Lukadam, what is the penalty for apostasy? And, well, um, before... Uh, we keep well, coming down this apostasy. Well, give, well, give, 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 give us a quick answer if, if on if what was, is the penalty for apostasy. Islamic country, country, you Sorry? very well know, if it's an Islamic country, then the Sharia is very clear. Apostrophe, apostrophe is dealt with the death penalty. Thank you. That's all yeah, I well, want well, to hear. But what's, that, what's, the, what's the relevance between what happens in an Islamic country and Great Britain? I fear to see the connection. We come to the closing of these questions. Thank you to our panel here, to our specialists, to the audience. Um, thank you to for watching. Goodbye. I think that uh, using the word God or uh, or the attitude of faith toward that which you don't know is uh, is a cop out. It's a way of s slapping a label onto something uh, rather than trying to understand it. Or since we may not not understand everything, uh, just say there's some things we don't understand. Uh, to invent stories uh, that sound as if they were true or could be true, to pretend that they're true just so that we can have a story. I think is is unsatisfying and it could even be immoral because it could lead you to uh, mistaken policies, to uh, getting in the way of your best understanding of how the world works, um, to doing things that could that lead to more harm than good. I mean, the concrete example would be treating uh, cancer with some cockamamie uh, herbal or homeopathic formula instead of the best medicine that we have. Uh, or justifying uh, <coughs> invasions and murders and sacrifices on the grounds of uh, appeasing some god or carrying out some divine mandate. I think there's nothing but mischief that can come from inventing um, stories for uh, that which we don't understand. There's nothing wrong with saying there's some things we don't understand. Yeah, there yes, most people have the uh, stereotype that science is about uh, inventing gadgets, curing diseases, monitoring the environment, a narrow uh, utilitarian focus on the material world, on, on uh, stuff and uh, bodies. But uh, science is much broader than that. It's really... <laughs> um, and you can read it anyway. Using Yahoo's search engine, I have just searched the World Wide Web for I freely confess absurd in the highest degree and obtained 2,890 hits. For comparison, I then searched for if numerous gradations from a perfect and complex I, which is from the following passage, and obtained only 
1,550 hits. The former phrase has been quoted nearly twice as often as the latter. Let's call this a mining index of two. It's actually quite a modest mining index. The Cambrian explosion, as you probably know, is an event in the history of life, in the fossil history, in which they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. I subjected that phrase to Yahoo's search engine and got 1,250 hits. I then looked at the next bit. <laughs> Evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record and got 63 hits. This gives a mining index, 1250 divided by 63 of nearly 20, 19.8. I want now to introduce a special kind of quote mining, which I think you'll recognize uh, when you see it. I call it mining the Eddington concession. Which it appears that about half a billion years ago, a little bit more, most of the great animal phyla rather suddenly appear in the fossil record. Needless to say, creationists love it because it looks to them as though that was, there was nothing before that. These phyla just suddenly sprang into existence. In The Blind Watchmaker, I wrote, I was young and foolish in those days and not aware of the potential for quote mining, I wrote that, that the majority of animal phyla, we find them, quote, already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. I went on to say, needless to say, this is quite a well-known one from Charles Darwin. Darwin, faced with the complexity of the eye, said, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Well, that famous quotation was always going to be a prime candidate for quote mining, omitting, of course, the words that immediately follow it. Yet reason tells me. <laughs> I think you know it. The appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Well, I was savvy enough evidently to realize that creationists would love it, but not in 1986 savvy enough to know that they would gleefully quote my lines back at me in their own favor carefully admitting what followed, which was a rather lengthy explanation of the Cambrian explosion and about how, in fact, it must have been preceded by a very long period of evolutionary history. I went on to say, evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record. Well, I... Uh, did my quote mining index calculation on this as well. Uh, I took the phrase, it is as though